Okay, morning everyone. Um, I'm going to confess, I cannot pronounce our speaker's name. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't, we don't always, all get raised to the same language, so I'll let her say it rather than risk offense. Um, and the title of the talk is right up there in front of you. And we're already five minutes late because our previous talk ran out of time, so I'm not going to give a long talk here. I'm just going to hand the mic over. Um, I am going to cut five minutes out of question time so that we can get back on schedule as, and hopefully not have to cut into our speaker's time. Thanks. Uh, uh, morning. Uh, am I audible? Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Sewahudimu Matlapeng. And I'm a junior developer and a half marathon runner. Hopefully next time I'll, I do this, I'll have run a full marathon. Um, full disclaimer, I use a lot of cake analogies. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, my little sister used to do this thing where at around 10.30 or 9, she would always like text me with her homework questions and then kind of ask me to give her answers immediately because it was almost bedtime. And if I didn't give her answers immediately, she'd call my mom. And one day I kind of asked her what was happening because she's not, I don't think she's lazy. And then she told me that um, whenever she does her homework, her friends and her, they do it in a group chat. And they always help each other out. But most of the time they can't get answers because they both have, they all have the same access to resources and they all kind of share the same pool of knowledge. But they kind of then responsible for helping each other. So one thing that really um, helps at the end is when she asks me and then I have more resources and I can help her with homework and then she can spread that information to all her friends. And she asked me late at night not to kind of manipulate me into giving her the answers immediately, but because her and her friends already exhausted their resources. And so that's when I decided to come up with this platform called Booza, which is a Q&A site for high school kids to be able to ask each other questions and ask other people um, for questions um, with relation to specific subjects. And so the idea is that um, you should be able to go into a specific subject and then ask for help and then um, get answers from other previously answered questions or, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, get help from other people who may be majors in the field, people who may have careers. For instance, if you're doing grade 10 IT, I may be able to help you with questions. It's like Stack Overflow, but for high school students. Yeah, so in this talk, I'll kind of be talking about my journey building Booza from the moment I kind of decided that I want to do this up, all the way up to the point where I had to deploy it for user testing and then all the stuff I learned in between. So I started Booza as a side project working with Pi, who couldn't be here today. And this talk pretty much summarizes all the things I've learned <laughs> and hopefully they'll stick through. Yeah. The first thing when you come up with, when you realize that there's a problem, is I think we all suffer from this, this is what I call the dev savior syndrome, where you think, ah, oh, there's a problem, how can I use technology to fix it? Because technology can fix everything. But truth of the matter is, sometimes we have this idea that technology can solve everything, more specifically with regards to issues that relate to um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds. We think we can just deploy these applications and then kind of stuff them in their faces and go, look, here's technology, your problems will be solved. But really, we need to think more thoroughly about how we apply technology as a tool. And we shouldn't be like doc doctors with a stethoscope, thinking that um, I have this one tool and I can fix everything using it. But rather think of technology as a means to an end and not an end to a means. So before you think of building an application to solve something, ask yourself, is this technology, is this a problem that requires technology, and is software development really the best answer for this? Another um, interesting thing to think about is a quote by Rich Screncher in his blog. Um, the best code is no code at all, where he argues that because we're software developers, oftentimes we feel the need to say, I'm going to build something that's so much better and it's going to be specific for this product and it's going to change the way software development has been seen. But really, you don't need to build your own package from scratch. You may not use to need to build like your own framework to build something or build your own IED so that you can start working on your project but you can actually use pre-existing technologies that may not require your software development skills and that you shouldn't look at that as something that's demeaning, that you came up with a solution using somebody else's package or somebody else's development. There's so many open source projects that can do so many things that you don't always need to write your own package. And when you write your own software, it has to be maintained, it has to be up to standard, it has to have contributors, it's going to have bugs and you're going to need to go back to it. So it's so much easier when you use someone else's code. <laughs> 
Yeah, so for Booza, we decided that we would <laughs> need technology for this because the problem is that um, textbooks may be a good solution for students, but textbooks have a static way of learning where they give the student information and don't really kind of, they're not immersive. So the development is not based on the student's um, reaction to learning. It's kind of like a very static way of presenting information. So with technology, it's much easier for the student to kind of learn based on their own interests, their own progress. And another reason we decided to um, develop Booza from scratch is because we looked at Stack Exchange, which has a really good Q&A platform, but we wanted to localize the content for South African students, looking at the fact that um, the education barrier, the barrier with access to resources, and also just literature is so much more different when you're developing for kids, especially in South Africa from the disadvantaged backgrounds. How do we provide this platform in multiple different languages and allow students to engage in a way that's more localized for them? and also localized for the South African curriculum. Yeah, and the first thing I had to do when I started Booza, at this point I was kind of like, I had decided this on my own, and I was like, I'm gonna do this, is it's always really difficult to choose a framework. Normally when you're in school, you kind of, um, when I was in university, they tell you that we're gonna start this thing, you're gonna choose a framework, and then you're gonna have A and B, C, D requirements, and you kind of use it, and that's kind of it. But when I started this, because it was my first side project, I had to choose a framework. And it's so much easier when you go, I want to learn React, let's see what I can do with React, and then you kind of learn on the go and you add all these features. But when I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do and I didn't know which framework to choose, it was so much harder. And I had all these blog articles about comparing Flask to Django, and there were so many matrices, and they were like comparing Hello World and how much faster it takes in one app to another. And at the end of a lot of these matrices, I was kind of wondering, so which one do you think I should choose? <laughs> and that's one of the things that really made it difficult for me. There's so many packages. But at the end, I kind of discovered that it really depends on the size and complexity of your project. If you're building something that's kind of like a full stack framework, like for instance with Booza, it's a Q&A site. It's not anything necessarily like different or revolutionary. It's just a, it's more similar to a blogging site. So I'm not going to have to build everything from scratch. It's rather um, develop something that has already got a from a full stack framework that has a lot of features and comes with it, and these are like Django and Pyramid. So this whole time, I'd been trying so hard to compare Flask and Django, but really, I was kind of like, they have such different uses that those matrices may not have been as important as I thought I was, as I thought they were. So Flask and Cherry Pie are more like microservice frameworks, so if you're developing something that's a single application and something that's got one specific thing that you want to have flexibility when you're building, it will be much easier to use um, microservice frameworks as opposed to full-stack frameworks that come with a lot, a lot of features, but then you can't really go into the nitty-gritty with each of those features. Yeah, in the end, what really um, what helped me choose Django was that I had other people around me who had used Django before, and that was like the one thing that made a huge difference, is that if I ever get stuck with this project, I know who to call for help, I have someone I can call and be like, hey, I'm having this and this issue, and I know that those people will be able to help me. And that makes a huge difference between all the repos that I have that kind of died out after like five commits because I couldn't suddenly figure out what's happening anymore, and all the repos that kind of made it to some, something that meant some, that kind of was usable, because um, when I get stuck with something, I don't know if everyone has the same issue, when you've kind of been working on one like, little thing that you can't figure out for a couple of days, and then eventually you go, you know what, let me start a new journey and a new adventure and just leave this one behind. <laughs> but when you have someone you can call and be like, oh, I have a bug that looks like this, and then they can go, oh, let me look at it, or they're like, oh, I get that all the time, it's actually really simple, just uninstall this package. It's so much easier and makes a huge difference when you're choosing a framework. Yeah, so um, when I started Django, I actually had very little experience with Python, so I was kind of like I was learning Python and learning Django, and for a very long time I couldn't differentiate between the two, between what, how they work. And another thing that made it very confusing as a person who was new to Python was pip and a virtual environment. I knew that I had to create a virtual environment, and then through the virtual environment I'd have pip, but I couldn't differentiate 
what each one meant and how these two kind of work together. So whenever my environment, something looked wrong or I couldn't figure out what was happening with PIP, I'd just remove the virtual environment, start from scratch, and then later on I'd figure out that there's still a problem and then I kind of had to like call Pi and be like, I don't know what's going on. But um, when you're choosing uh, a virtual like, environment setup, I then later on discovered like what the difference between having a virtual environment and a virtual environment wrapper and having a package manager actually really meant. And as um, I started to use them more, I kind of realized there were quite a few <laughs> issues with PIP in terms of there being like a completely different library for package installation, for creating a virtual environment, and um, my trying to figure out what the differences between the two actually mean. Another issue with PIP that when you start using it more is the requirements file. I often found that I didn't update it as much as I used to, and I wouldn't, if I didn't need something anymore, I'd uninstall it, but then forget to update the requirements file. And this creates a lot of issues later on when you're trying to figure out why things are breaking, or why there's things in your virtual environment that, you, that are behaving weirdly. And also when you're working with someone else, it's so much harder when you have transitive dependencies lying around that are still lying around because you installed something and then it installed a bunch of other things and now you have an error and the person next to you doesn't have that error and you can't deterministically figure out why you guys are getting two completely different results with the same in code. Yeah. So, then I was introduced to PipEnv, and now every time I hear someone complaining about how they don't understand why their code doesn't work in their environment, but it works into someone else's environment, I'm like, have I introduced you to PipEnv? <laughs> so um, PipEnv automatically creates and manages uh, virtual environments for your project, and it also manages packages. So you don't have to worry about um, having environments that are completely different, because your PIP um, because it creates a pip log file which has everything you need in it and it kind of keeps a record of all your packages you've installed and then that makes it so much easier for you to not have to worry about what's going on. And it can also help you reproduce deterministic builds, builds which make a huge difference when you're running on Travis. Yeah, so this is what a pip file looks like. It just generates a pip file and it looks really simple. The most important thing here is kind of determining which Python package, which Python version your application is running on. And it creates this file automatically if you don't create it. And then it uses the default uh, Python version as the one that's created when you install pipenv. So if you don't have it, it can determine that this virtual environment, sorry, uses Python 3.6 and it sets that as the default. And then other people who run your um, application, will also, it will also it checks the machine for that Python version, and then it automatically runs the app on that. One really amazing thing about pip is that it has a pip block file, which kind of stores all the, all the packages that are installed in your machine, and also all the versions and hashes. So the cool thing about the hash is that when you install a package, sometimes you get different versions or different or versions that have the same name but have different code in them. So the nice thing about uh, PipLock is that it actually hashes to the exact release that you installed. Even if someone else makes an update to that release, it will go straight into that one. And that's really helpful for creating a t deterministic build. And it always has the exact version that your uh, application is running on, unlike with a requirements file where you kind of sometimes, it doesn't have a requirement and it will pick up the latest version and sometimes the latest version can cause errors in your code, so you'd rather be able to pick that up very quickly instead of having to find out later on when you run your code in production or on Travis. And pip also has this really cool thing called the pip graph, which actually shows you that, um, for instance, you can look there, it says PyTest Django has the following transitive dependencies and the exact version of those transitive dependencies. And this is really cool because um, when, it un when you uninstall PyTest, it will uninstall all those dependencies for you so that your environment just doesn't have a lot of stuff lying around. And also that if the next person um, tries to run your code, they have the exact, same the exact same environment. And it's also cool for managing complex dependencies. For instance, PyTest Django might need pluggy list 0.7, but then another package might need plug pluggy 1. So that's also really cool for managing that and ensuring that things don't clash out. So 
Getting started with pip env is relatively simple, <laughs> and you can even install everything in your requirements file into your pip env into your pip env file. So if you just pip env install everything in the requirements file, and then that gets you started with a pip env and a pip log file. Every time I hear someone when I tell people about pip env, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you should use this. It's so much better. They always tell me, um. I hear what you're saying, but you know it's not really like I'm not going to change what I've been doing. I know the struggle and I know how to get away around it. And it's also just because of uh, people. As much as we like to say we are willing to change, it's also like very much a matter of I've kind of been struggling with this. It's my struggle. I understand it. <laughs> and it's not. There's no actual reason. Like no one gives you like a. This is why and why why because of bugs and whatnot. So I think starting with pimpev makes it much easier for you later on not to feel like this is my struggle. I identify with it. Yeah, and one of the things I'm still really struggling with, even implementing new features and like with coding, is do not rush into coding. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you have an idea, and the first thing you do, instead of like mapping it out and trying to figure out what you do, the first thing you do is you start coding, and then halfway through your feature implementation, you realize, what am I doing? Like, how is this actually like? I, I, how is this actually going to work? And then sometimes you kind of forget what you were actually trying to do in the beginning because you had the spark and you kind of tried to turn it into code, and halfway through you kind of were like. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. So it's one of the things I had to learn when I was building Booza is not to rush into just adding features just for the sake of adding features. Another thing um, that was really interesting for me to learn is when I was telling people about Booza and I was like, yeah, it's really going to be helpful, I think, to my <laughs> little sister, is that she would then also tell me, you know, it should have this, it should have that, and I think this would really help. I'd also like to take images, and I'd also like if I had textbooks, and I was like, oh my gosh, I was writing all of this down, and I was like, this is what I'm going to add. And one of my friends was actually like, one interesting thing she was like to me, you know, you should add voice notes, because a lot of students really struggle to um, write down, but if they can speak in their home languages and ask each other questions, this would be really amazing. Mind you, I hadn't even chosen a framework, but I knew I'd have voice notes on this application. And so when I started working, I had all this stuff that did not work, but I was like, I have all these fields in my model. And my voice note was actually saved as like an integer field. And I was like, later on, when I do implement a voice note in Django, I will add this stuff. And then what happened is I had all these fields, a huge um, model file for, question, for questions. And most of the stuff didn't work. But I was like really proud of myself because I had it. But one thing it did was it overwhelmed me. I felt like there was so much missing. My images weren't rendering properly. I didn't really have subjects. My tags weren't working. And it felt like I was like, under all these features that I personally couldn't manage. And what that resulted in is it causes you a lot of fatigue, because instead of seeing progress, you just see a whole bunch of stuff that's missing. And when I actually <laughs> restarted it, in the end, I ended up with a question title, a body, and who asked the question. And that was all there is. And even though like, it felt like I was dumbing down the application, and it kind of like when I would show it to um, my little sister, because I was kind of working with her like, all the time to kind of implement the stuff, it felt like it had moved to literally just nothing, and it felt really small. But at the same time, I felt like I could manage it. Like I could, I, I could fix anything that went wrong, and I know when it went wrong because it was so much easier to work with. And later on, when I added subjects, I had time to kind of like think about what the subject would look like and how it would fit into the model and test it out. So continuously adding features is so much easier and less overwhelming when you're starting a project than starting with all the specs for all this rich stuff that everyone suggests, and you think this is going to be amazing. Another thing to think about also is that, like I said, more f a bug is really just a feature waiting to happen. So when the more you add stuff, the more bugs you have, the more things that go wrong. And when more things go wrong, you actually spend so much of your time trying to fix these bugs, trying to get everything to work, that you're not, it's not fun anymore. It just feels like everything's going wrong, left, right, and center, and then you're just like, you know what, screw it, I'm done. <laughs> and yeah. So when I was in university, I used to write what I was notorious for writing the worst code. And all my friends would ask for my assignments and then just be like, what is going on? And I was always like, if it works, don't ask me questions. <laughs> But um, it's because I, I had a really hard time letting go of code. 
even if I knew I'd worked so hard to implement this method in this feature, and later on I realized there was a much way better way of doing it, I would just comment it out and write it neatly and be like, this does this, and that, and that, and that. I found a, way, a better way of doing it, but I feel like I should archive this code in my code base, which makes absolutely no sense, but was because I couldn't let go of code. And I didn't care how messy my code looked or how no one could read it. I, just, like, I was like, if I can get it to work on my own, I was just like, I'm cool with it. But um, when I started working on Booza and whatnot, I was aware of the fact that other people have to look at my code, other people have to work on my code and contribute to it, because it's an open source project and I'd like other people to be able to add things to it and not just myself, which then brings the question of how do I write code that other people can contribute to, that other people can read and use, and that no one should look at my code and be like, yeah, babes, what's going on here? Like, no one should have to read all the methods I had implemented but never really used because I felt that they were important. So um, with static testing, kind of like questions, like it brings us to think about our coding and not just to write code that's just code and that no one can actually read. A good way to start your static test is a code review, which I was not always a big fan of. <laughs> Um, so the thing that kind of bothered me a lot in the beginning about code reviews is that um, you have to wait until the other person has time and then you're kind of in a rush and you've got this like high and you're like, no, I want to add this, I want to add that, I'm moving really fast. And then the person who's meant to review your code is like, I have a million things in my backlog, this is not a priority for me. And then one of the things I would do is, you know, if it's really overwhelming, they're most likely going to give me a plus one. <laughs> and so I would make a pull request that had all these features and all these changes. And what Pi would do is she would then um, say to me, OK, cool, there's something. She would pick up something really small. And then I knew I'd have to wait two days until she reviewed it again. And it was, and it was really easy for me to leave trailing lines or like, to make flake ache errors simply because I was writing so much code I wasn't keeping track of it. And then I'd get really hurt when I'd have a pull request with all the super cool stuff and she'd be like, yeah, there's a trailing print line here. And I was like, I have to wait two more days for her to look at it again. So, but when I started writing smaller pull requests, I, got, I started getting faster and better feedback because I would look at the code and I, it was much easier for me to write code that made more sense. And then it was much nicer for the other person not to have to like, suffer through my 500 lines of code. So um, I like to think of Flake 8 as a restaurant inspector, so like a health inspector. So Flake 8, the Flake 8 doesn't really care if your cake is pretty, if your food is nice. They're just here to make sure that there's no rats lying around, there's, no, there's nothing going wrong that's unhealthy in your code. So it will check for things like um, imports that are unused, variables that are unused, calling a variable that doesn't exist because you presumed it exists, and then you realize later on you changed the variable name. So Flake 8 helps you kind of clean, clean that stuff up. So getting started with Flake 8 is relatively easy, and it's also easy to kind of say, hey, ignore these files, could be everything, could be some files, we don't know. And also setting the maximum line length. And statically type MyPy. So MyPy kind of helps you check if your, uh, your Python code is statically, is statically correct. I think when I started learning with starting Python, moving from Java to Python, one thing I really liked was that I didn't have to always think about the types, and I could just like ship stuff and it would automatically do it for me. But then I remember this one time I started to appreciate MyPy, is when I was, this method was expecting uh, some kind of dictionary or an array, and then I was passing a string I was into that method. And then what it did is, it took each character in the string and turned it into an array. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out, why are you doing this? And then um, later on I realized that this method is actually expecting an array and not a string, and that's why it was behaving that way. So static, static, static tests and checks kind of help you uh, try to avoid some unpredictability in your code and find yourself in situations where you're like, this, this is not what I want you to do, why are you doing this? So, um, yeah. And then there's iSort. iSort is like the sprinkle on top of your icing. What it really does is just sorts your imports. It makes it look prettier. <laughs> it doesn't essentially do anything outside of that. Most people don't even think about their imports, but iSort kind of like, it's cute. And it's nice because you can just run with, with a check only, or you can just run iSort and it will, instead of saying this failed, it actually sorts them out for you. So it's kind of, you have nothing to lose with iSort. It just makes your code look prettier. 
So yeah, now that you've kind of like got a framework going and you've got your environment set up so that you kind of force yourself to write really nice code, and you've also thought about your, uh, your application and its core functionality and how that functionality will work, you can actually really start coding, which was really fun for me. <laughs> But another thing that kind of like kind of like breaks for me was then writing tests because when we started working and I was working with Pi and then she was like, yeah, so let's start the test folder and I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, we're going to write tests. And I'm like, but we haven't written code yet. Why are we writing tests? And then she's like, yeah, it's important to write tests for stuff so that you can determine how it works. And when I had started building Booza by myself before she kind of discarded most of my code, I had one test for one method. For one model, yes, I had a model test for the questions. But the problem with that was there were so many things in it that were not working that I was expecting not to work that testing it was painfully difficult. Testing a voice note to say this voice note is stored at one made no sense to me, and that's why I stopped testing because there were so many things to start all at once that testing all of them was overwhelming, and that put me off testing completely. It just felt like it was too much work and was unnecessary, so I turned to regression tests. And then um, what Pi kind of like taught me with working with tests is that you should actually test one feature at a time and then continuously implement your tests. And that kind of got me into it. And I started to appreciate tests more when things went wrong that I couldn't pick up in my reg regression test. But then my tests would pick up that something went wrong. And I'd look at my tests and I'd be like, oh yeah, it's because I updated that. So that makes sense. So um, working on Booza, this was the first model. It kind of roughly looked like this. I removed all the other stuff from it just to make it easier to see. So we had that model, and the test for it looked like this. And once I got the habit of testing, it was like so much nicer. Like it felt like it felt so intuitive once you get into the habit of stuff. And I always love model tests. I love model tests now, and they always encourage me to keep my models as simple as possible, and it's really easier to get them going. One of the tests I still have a problem with <laughs> is kind of testing for your view sets and ensuring that you've kind of checked everything for that. Um, when I started, what I'd create is I'd do everything and then go test for it. But later on, I learned that it's so much easier to write your, write your tests and then go implement the feature. Because you know, as you add something, you check how your tests respond to it, and then you can continuously implement stuff. And so you'd start by checking that the URL is there and that the HTTP response is OK, and that the right template is being used, and you get the right feedback, for, for instance, which is checking an empty question list view in this case. And so you start off with that test, and then you create the actual views file that's going to be used by the URL for that, and then you, then uh, this is the URL that would then call the view. And so everything that's missed, everything that's in red here, I slowly then implement in the test. And every time I run the test again after adding something, I can see that there's a slight difference. The point to which it kind of didn't work anymore moves further and further down. And that makes it, like, it feels so much more rewarding. It's like you're playing like a little game with yourself where you're like, I wrote the test, and then I write the code, and then I slowly see the test improving. It's really nice. <laughs> and then you create the actual template, and then you can ensure that the tests in the template work. And then once you've got your basic, basic test down, you can also start testing the really cool stuff like, is the right heading being implemented? Is the right, um, uh, the user, is the username being connected to the right question, is the time okay, and stuff like that. So after I've added the URL, the view, and the, the template, this test should then pass. And the cool thing about it is that once, if this test fails, I kind of have a really good idea of where and what went wrong. I don't have to write a test and then something fails and I'm kind of like, I've written so much code, I don't exactly know where this failure came in. And then you can then implement your test to actually then adding a question object, adding a user object, and then writing tests for that, for whether the question heading appears in your template and that everything is working. Yeah, another thing for Boozer that was really important, which is why I'm really glad I used Django, is Django has a really good authentication system. And because with Boozer, what we don't want happening is we don't want um, we don't want students being able to edit another student's question and then possibly having some, like, uh, some ethical issues that come up with it. So another thing that I took very seriously is testing for authentication and ensuring that users 
um, data is protected and that no one can edit another user's question. And then later on, someone else is looking like they're saying really horrible stuff online, but it wasn't them. Yeah, and then test coverage. So um, when you're writing tests for me, because I was starting out and um, it was really difficult to determine if I had written enough tests, if my tests were doing exactly what I wanted and needed them to do, and if all the code, code was tested. Because one thing I'm really good at is going, you know, I really can't get this test to pass. If I remove it, no one will see. <laughs> and um, so test coverage is like, someone will see if you remove that code, because um, that, that uh, line of code won't be executed in your test. So um, when things started looking really good for me, I used this picture specifically because this is when things started looking so much better and I had had enough tests to cover stuff. And this is what it looks like in the red. It uh, just shows where your code doesn't cover at all. This is normally stuff like your settings. Well, you should test settings, so that's a horrible example. Your URLs file or any other files that you can't necessarily really test for or test that are implied, it's like some, some parts of your code that you can't test for. And then the orange will be where you've coded, you've tested for this, but you haven't tested for it vigorously. And you can't see it now, but you should be able to hover around and actually see which files are tested well and which part of your code is actually not covered. And this is really nice for holding you accountable for your own tests and your own code. Yay! And so once I've got all my, like, I've got my environment set up, I've written my code, and my tests should roughly be well covered, another important thing to think about is continuously integrating your code. Um, so continuous integration kind of forces you to ensure that the code you push to development or to production, or whoever you're pushing it to, is actually less likely to break because it's been tested locally. It's ensured that your test coverage is actually not going to go down because of this. And new code is actually being thoroughly looked into and before you push it to production. And also shares that um, it also encourages you to make smaller changes because smaller changes are less likely to need more testing and less likely to break stuff in production. And so what we use with Pi for, con for um, continuous integration is Travis. And so Travis just mitigates the question of like, it works on my environment, but it may not work in someone else's environment. So it creates a completely separate environment and then it tries to run your code and then the Sometimes you can set Travis to also deploy your code on Docker, but this is a simple um, Travis file which then caches pip and then installs everything your requirements filed and then installs coveralls and it runs your flake 8. It really sucks when you wait 30 minutes for Travis to give you feedback only for you to find out that it was a flake 8 error and you're like, it hasn't even run your tests. <laughs> and then it runs your, tr um, your template linked, which you can then look at your templates to see if there's any tags that are there that are not meant to be there. And then it runs your PyTest also. Then the last thing it does is run your PyTest. This, oh, this is a really good strategy because it ensures that um, you don't go, oh, I know Flake 8 failed, but my PyTest passed. I don't really care. Yay. And when it comes to um, developing your code, it can be really fun and scary at the same time because you have to like do stuff. And you also have to decide which deployment method is really best for you and your project. And what I've kind of like gotten the hang around is one of the two major ways to decide if you're deploying an application. It can be using a container as a service versus using a platform as a service, and that would be Heroku, and Docker would be the container. And from my perspective, it looks like if you're using Docker, you have more control over how your plane, go, how your plane um, takes off and you have more flexibility around it and it seems like something cooler to work with. And with Heroku, it's more like just launching a rocket. I'm not a rocket. I'm not sure which one is harder, but it kind of looks like with Heroku, you push a button, it goes up and then it comes down. But with Docker, you can kind of decide what environment you want and what cruise control you can set it to. So with Heroku, it's literally you can connect it to your GitHub project and then press a button and it will deploy it. If something goes wrong, you get a 500 error message and kind of have to hope for the best <laughs> because you don't have much control over it. You have to keep trying and try, keep trying to figure out why your application didn't work. And you have to also look at your logs and then try to fix it because you don't really have much control over it. It's just the platform that they provide for you. 
And with Docker, you actually have more control over it. They give you a container, and within that container, you can give it a set of instruction as to what it does and how it does it. And I chose Heroku because it was easier for me to do and easier for me to implement, and I didn't have as much time because I was doing a user study, so that was my specific reason. I know that there's other reasons for other people who prefer more, flexi more flexibility, but for me, it was just a matter of timing, and also I didn't have all the skills and resources to deploy on Docker. And yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> and if you'd like to contribute to Booza, here's our GitHub uh, link, and it's open source. Thank you. Well, there's a quick congrats for me on being the person who I have chaired so, so far who has been the best at following time warnings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's got a question? Hi, I just wanted to ask about that um, iSort module, because I haven't used it before. You said that it, it, it puts all your imports in alphabetical order. Yeah. But what I wanted to know is, does it put, does it put them only in alphabetical order, or does it also follow the PayPay guidelines? So that if it's a standard import from the standard library, and it has, like say, for instance, import JSON, yeah. would it take it and throw it right at the end? Or would it also put it maybe at the beginning, because it's from the standard library? I am not exactly sure about that, <laughs> to be honest. I haven't looked at it that much, but Jeremy is about to answer you. <laughs> um, it does. It puts standard library imports at the top. Um, I have had some strange problems where it doesn't necessarily know about new standard library um, packages for newer Python versions. You might need to tell it about those if you're using shiny new things in Python 3.8 or whatever. Um, but in general, it'll follow those pep eight guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's working. Is oh it working? Yeah. Yes. Siwe I can't pronounce your name. Yes. Um, <laughs> I want to know um, how can okay, cool. I contribute in a non-engineering way? Do you have any ideas for like? How yes, can that would actually be really amazing. <laughs> Because um, we have um, all the people who are contributing at the moment, we're all engineers, and it kind of seems to be a bit all over the place where we all kind of don't know what we're doing. So we'd really appreciate whether it's service design or project management or someone to help with the user studies that we're conducting in. I conducted the first one in Rustenburg, but the ones we're running are now like in Cape Town. So if you're willing to contribute to that, then that would be amazing. We have on the ZA Slack channel, on the ZA like we have a channel called Booza, so you can join that channel and be like, hello. And then if you have anything to contribute, we have also a Trello board that you can look at and be like, this should be first and whatnot. I asked someone, like I need, like we need like a project manager because things are like all over the place. <laughs> yeah, so that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, my question is, hello. My question is, was some of the, lessons that you've learned, I see like mid-level developers and senior developers make those mistakes as well. Um, are you confident enough to call them out? Because I think you've got quite a few great lessons. Confident to call out a senior developer? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think um, if it's on like a PR, then spotting an error is always really nice. It's not nice when someone does it to you, but it always makes me feel like, oh, I understand something. This really complicated pull request. I managed to find an error, <laughs> which is sometimes just the syntax error, but it makes me feel good. <laughs> and then one last question is, um, what does Booza mean? Does it mean anything? Um, Booza means ask in Zulu. I always have to actually explain that. When I did the user study, I was in Rustenburg, where everyone speaks Setswana, and the students kept saying, what's Booza? And then eventually, when they were doing the user study, they were like, oh yeah, Booza is Zulu for us, right? That makes sense. <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time. I did say we will have to cut short question time a bit short. Um, last thing is, is, I got a small piece of swag to hand out, and I think yes. the best question I've, you can get is, can I help? So I think that's going to you. Yay. It is tea time. After